Hello everyone, this is Mike History 2, and today I will be talking about the Battle of Berlin, Part 2. So, of course, don't forget to watch Part 1 if you haven't already, or else this won't really make that much sense. So, the Second Belarusian Front had established a bridgehead 15 kilometers deep on the west bank of the Oder, and was heavily engaged with the 3rd Panzer Army. The 9th Army had lost Kotbis and was being pressured from the east. A Soviet tank spearhead was on the Havel River to the east of Berlin, and another had at one point penetrated the inner defensive ring of Berlin. On April 23, 1945, the Soviet 1st Belarusian Front and 1st Ukrainian Front continued to tighten the encirclement, severing the last link between the German 9th Army and the city. Elements of the 1st Ukrainian Front continued to move westward and started to engage with the German 12th Army, moving towards Berlin. On the same day, Hitler appointed General Helmuth Weidling, as a commander of the Berlin Defense Area, replacing Lieutenant General Reimann. Meanwhile, by April 24, 1945, elements of the 1st Belarusian Front and 1st Ukrainian Front had completed the encirclement of the city. By the end of the next day, it was clear that the German defense of the city could not do anything but temporarily delay the capture of the city by the Soviets, since the decisive stages of the battle had already been fought and lost by the Germans outside the city. Now, by that time, Schirner's offensive, initially successful, had mostly been pushed back, although he did manage to inflict significant casualties on the opposing Polish and Soviet units, slowing down their progress. Now, the forces available to General Weidling for the city's defense include around 45,000 soldiers in several severely depleted German army and Waffen-SS divisions. These divisions were supplemented by the police force, Boys in the Hitler Youth, and the Volkssturm. Many of the 40,000 elder men of the Volkssturm had been in the army as young men, and some were veterans of World War I. Hitler appointed SS Brigadenführer Wilhelm Monke, the battle commander for the central government district that included the Reich Chancellery and the Führerbunker. He had over 2,000 men under his command. Weidling organized the defenses into eight sectors designated A through 2H, each one commanded by a colonel or a general, but most had no combat experience. To the west of the city was the 20th Infantry Division. To the north of the city was the 9th Parachute Division. To the northeast of the city was the Panzer Division, Mugeburg. To the southeast of the city and to the east of the Tempelhof Airport was the 11th SS Panzer Grenadier Division, Nordland. The reserve, the 18th Panzer Grenadier Division, was in Berlin's center. On the 23rd of April, Berzerin's 5th Shock Army and Katukov's 1st Guards Tank Army assaulted Berlin from the southeast and after overcoming a counterattack by the German LVI, I don't even I think that's 56th Panzer Corps, reached the Berlin S Bahn Ring Railway on the north side of the Teltow Canal by the evening of the 24th of April. During the same period, of all the German forces ordered to reinforce the inner defenses of the city by Hitler, only a small contingent of French SS volunteers under the command of SS Brigadefuhr Gustav Krukenberg arrived in Berlin. During the 25th of April, Krukenberg was appointed as the commander of Defense Sector C, the sector under the most pressure. On April 26th, Chuikov's 8th Guards Army and the 1st Guards Tank Army fought their way through the southern suburbs and attacked Tempelhof Airport, just inside the S-Bahn defensive ring, where they met stiff resistance from the Mückeburg Division. But by April 27th, the two understrength divisions that were defending the southeast, now facing five Soviet armies from east to west, the 5th Shock Army, the 8th Guards Army, the 1st Guards Tank Army, and Rybalko's 3rd Guards Tank Army were forced back towards the center, taking up new defensive positions around Hermannplatz. Krukenberg informed General Hans Krebs, chief of the general staff, that within 24 hours the Nordland would have to fall back to the center sector. The Soviet advance to the city center was along these main axes, from the southeast along the Frankfurter Alley, from the south along Sonnen Alley, ending north of the Belle Alliance Platz, from the south ending near the Potsdamer Platz, and from the north ending near the Reichstag. The Reichstag, the Moltke Bridge, Alexander Platz, and the Havel Bridges that Spandau saw the heaviest fighting with house-to-house -house and hand-to-hand -hand combat. The foreign SS soldiers were fighting particularly hard because they were ideologically motivated and they believed that they would not live if they were captured. In the early hours of the 29th of April, the Soviet 3rd Shock Army crossed the Moltke Bridge and started to fan out into the surrounding streets and buildings. The initial assaults on the buildings, including the Ministry of the Interior, were hampered by the lack of supporting artillery. 
It was not until the damaged bridges were repaired that the artillery could be moved up in support. At 4 a.m. in the Führer bunker, Hitler signed his last will and testimony and shortly afterwards married Eva Braun. At dawn, the Soviets pressed on with their assault in the southeast. After very heavy fighting, they managed to capture Gestapo headquarters on Pr Prinz Albrechtstrasse, but a Waffen SS counterattack forced the Soviets to withdraw from the building. To the southwest, the 8th Guards Army attacked north across the Landwehr Canal into the Tiergarten. By the next day, the 30th of April, the Soviets had solved their bridging problems, and with artillery support at 6 o'clock, they launched an attack on the Reichstag, but because of German entrenchments and support from 12.8 centimeter guns on away on the roof of the Zoo Flak Tower, close by the Berlin Zoo. It was not until that evening that the Soviets were able to enter the building. The Reichstag had not been in use since it had been burned in February 1933, which I mentioned in my Hitler Part 2 video, so go check that out, and its exterior resembled a rubble heap more than a government building. The German troops inside made excellent use of this and were heavily entrenched. Fierce room-to-room -room fighting ensued. At that point, there was still a large force of German soldiers in the basement who launched counterattacks against the Red Army. On the 2nd of May, 1945, the Red Army controlled the entire building. And the famous photo of the two soldiers planting the flag on the roof of the building is a reenactment photo taken the day after the building was taken. To the Soviets, this event, um, as represented by the photo, became symbolic of their victory, demonstrating that the Battle of Berlin, as well as the Eastern Front as a whole, ended with a total Soviet victory. As the 756th Regiment commander's commander Zinchenko had stated in his order to battalion commander Neustroev, the Supreme High Command and the entire Soviet people order you to erect the victory banner on the roof above Berlin. That during the early hours of the 30th of April, Weidling informed Hitler in person that the defenders would probably exhaust their ammunition during the night. Hitler granted him permission to attempt a breakout through the encircling Red Army lines. That, arm, that afternoon, Hitler and Braun committed suicide and their bodies were cremated not far from the bunker. In accordance with Hitler's last will and testament, Admiral Karl Dönitz became the president and Joseph Goebbels became the new chancellor. Now, as the perimeter shrank and the surviving defenders fell back, they became concentrated into a small area in the city center. By now, there were about 10,000 German soldiers in the city center, which was being assaulted from all sides. One of the other main thrusts was along Wilhelmstrasse, on which the air ministry built of reinforced concrete, was pounded by large concentrations of Soviet artillery. The remaining German Tiger tanks of the Hermann von Salza battalion took up positions in the east of the Tiergarten to defend the city against Kuznetsov's 3rd Shock Army and the 8th Guards Army, advancing through the south of the Tiergarten. These Soviet forces had effectively cut the sausage-shaped area held by the Germans in half, and made any escape to attempt to the west for German troops the center much more difficult. Also, can you just appreciate the fact that the German area was shaped like a sausage? I don't think that was a coincidence. Anyways, during the early hours of the 1st of May, Krebs talked to General Chuikov, commander of the Soviet 8th Guards Army, informing him of Hitler's death and a willingness to negotiate a citywide surrender. They could not agree on terms because of Soviet insistence on unconditional surrender, and Krebs has claimed that he lacked authorization to agree to that. Goebbels was against surrender. However, in the afternoon, Goebbels and his wife killed their children and then themselves. Goebbels' death removed the last block to peace, which prevented Weidling from accepting the terms of unconditional surrender of his garrison. But he chose to delay the surrender until the next morning to allow the planned breakout to take place under the cover of darkness. So on the night of the 1st to the 2nd of May, most of the remnants of the Berlin garrison attempted to break out of the city center in three different directions. Only those that went west through the Tiergarten and crossed the Charlottenbrücke into Spandau succeeded in breaching Soviet lines. Only a handful of those who survived the initial breakout made it to the lines of the Western Allies. Most were either killed or captured by the Red Army's outer encirclement forces west of the city. Now, early in the morning of the 2nd of May, the Soviets captured the Reich Chancellery, and General Weidling surrendered with his staff at 6 o'clock. He was taken to see General Vasily Chuikov at age 23, where Weidling ordered the city's defenders to surrender to the Soviets. Now, the 350-strong garrison of the Zuflak Tower led the building. There was sporadic fighting in a few isolated buildings where some SS troops still refused to surrender, but the Soviets reduced such buildings to rubble. The city's food supplies had been largely destroyed on Hitler's orders. 
128 of the 226 bridges had been blown up, and 87 pumps were rendered useless. A quarter of the subway stations were underwater, flooded on Hitler's orders, and thousands of thousands who had sought shelter in them had drowned when the SS had carried out the blowing up of the protective devices on the Landwehr Canal. Now, according to Grigory Krivosheyev's work, based on declassified archival data, Soviet forces sustained 81,116 dead for the entire battle, which include the Battle of Seelov Heights and the Hub. And another 280,251 were wounded or sick during the battle. The operation also cost the Soviets about 1,997 tanks and SPGs. Now, he noted all losses of arms and equipment are accounted as irre irrecoverable losses, and therefore, this is only losses that could not, you know, ever be used again. Soviet estimates based on kill claim, claims placed German losses at around 458,000 killed and 479,000 captured. But German research puts the number of dead at approximately 92,000 to 100,000. The number of civilian casualties is unknown. But 125,000 are estimated to have died during the entire battle, making it one of the bloodiest of all time. So don't forget to like, subscribe, and share. I'll see you next time.